Amen. Y'all grab a seat. How are we doing this morning? Everybody caffeinated? Doesn't sound like it. <laughs> a couple of like half-hearted nods. Uh, well, it's a, a real honor, real privilege to be able to be back with you. I've been uh, here a handful of times over the years, and so I uh, really uh, feel a tight connection with this church and obviously this city. I went to uh, Bushland growing up through eighth grade because back uh, in those days there was no high school. Uh, apparently there is a high school now. I remember driving past there when they were deciding to build the high school and before they ever broke ground on the uh, any of the building or the classrooms, the football ball field was done. Uh, it was like Texas priorities, right? Uh, so for those of you uh, with Redeemer, just a great honor to be with you. Uh, JR and your crew, so excited to, uh, to see you and have some of you guys out. Really uh, proud of you and what you're doing there uh, on the east side. So um, we've got some time uh, today uh, to uh, hopefully slow down a bit and spend some time thinking through uh, what, uh, what does it look like to not just be a man, and not just be a godly man, but to uh, really embrace some spiritual disciplines uh, in the midst of a, a very distracted and busy world. Um, that some of the things that we need to be attending to as men, there's a lot of factors uh, around us that are going to try to push us uh, away from those and trying to distract us from doing some of the things um, that are most important um, so I just, I want to commend you for taking time out of what I, I know is a busy schedule with life and with kids and with work and school and all the things going on, to even set aside some time today because it is incredibly important. There's a lot of things in our society that are unbelievably broken, amen? Just unbelievably broken and dark and sad, uh, and uh, a lot of those things, I would, I would make the case most of those things um, you can trace back to a, a brokenness in men. Uh, that I have thought about this often over the years, preached and taught on it uh, quite a bit over the years. Uh, that, you know, we believe that in the beginning God made the male and female, made men and women uh, distinct yet very different. Uh, equal in value, equal in dignity, but have a different role, uh, especially in family and in the church. Uh, and there's just a uniqueness to when, when men are broken, that brokenness can very quickly seep out. Uh, as go, uh, goes a man, so goes his uh, marriage, so goes the family, so goes the church, so goes the culture. Uh, and if you look at a lot of the brokenness in our culture, you can trace it back to a lot of broken men. Uh, if you look at brokenness in our families and in this nation, and uh, just um, the sadness that we see of so many kids growing up without a father uh, or without a positive father in their life. You can trace some of that brokenness back uh, to men that have been broken. You chase uh, just a lot of the ills in our society you can trace back to men. But on the, the converse of that, uh, a lot of the things that uh, God does to heal churches and to heal families and to lead and change uh, cities and cultures, oftentimes he does that through changing men. I mean, I, even looking in this room, I think, goodness, what, a, what an incredible group of men that God changed the face of planet Earth through a group of men much, much smaller than this. I was reading this morning something D.L. Moody said uh, once. He said, the world has yet to see uh, what God can do with one man who is wholly surrendered to God. And so I just, I want to commend you for being here and setting aside the time and really want to ask and pray uh, that God would stir us up and do something in each one of us that would change our, our marriages you know, not, not only do we need men that are willing to step up, uh, but we need men that are willing to kneel down uh, and to be servants and to be selfless uh, in marriage and family. So uh, I pray that something happens um, that would spill over into your marriage, spill over into your churches, spill over even into the cities where God has placed us. So, uh, so that's where we're going in the three sessions that we have together uh, today. We're looking at three different uh, things, three different spiritual disciplines um, that we need to truly understand and to harness. Uh, and uh, I feel like it's probably good to say, but we're going to be all over the Bible. Uh, so go ahead and get yours out, whether it's a hard copy or a device, and uh, follow along. And I hope that you'll take some notes. And uh, we're going to have a lot, a lot to chew on. So uh, to take, take some good notes and then maybe spend some time in the next weeks and months uh, continually working through and processing through. Through, uh, through some of the things that we talk about. All right, uh, go to John chapter 17. 
Uh, that's where I want to start because I think it's healthy uh, to lay somewhat of a foundation in talking about uh, the end goal of spiritual disciplines um, because I think oftentimes we can kind of come up short um, with the actual end goal uh, and we can kind of short circuit the true purpose of all sorts of d- different disciplines um, that, we, uh, that we might pursue. Uh, and so I don't, I don't know in this room where, where, where you are in this spectrum. Uh, you know, I would assume uh, we've got men all over the spiritual spectrum. I would assume we have men in here that have been uh, walking with Jesus for a long time, uh, have uh, devoted their life to discipling and training others, and uh, maybe some are aspiring to, uh, to pastor, to plant, or to eldership. Uh, maybe some of you are like, I, I've got a little bit of understanding. I mean, I've read my Bible a little bit, don't know my way around it real well. Uh, and I would assume there's some of you maybe that are just brand new, uh, maybe intimidated intimidated by some of that, and so uh, I hope that it's helpful to everyone uh, on the entire, um, the, the entire scope of, of following Jesus. Uh, but with that in mind, I always want to back up and make sure uh, that when we jump into a text that give enough context so it's helpful for anyone, even if you're brand new. Uh, so John 17. I, you, I've noticed over the years that uh, there's a handful of different chapters that I just have gravitated towards, thought about, uh, studied, meditated on, and preached on a lot over the years, and this is one of those that probably there's five texts that I've just spent an inordinate, inordinate amount of time looking at, and John 17 is one of those. So here's, here's the context uh, for John 17. Um, the, the book of John is laid out in such an interesting fashion. It's written by the Apostle John, who's obviously one of the 12 disciples of Jesus, uh, one of the inner three that had the, um, the invitation to be uh, really in that close inner circle of Jesus. Uh, but even among those three, he would be the one that, bared the, that would bear the name, the disciple who Jesus loved. By most information that we have, he was probably Jesus' best friend, which is I mean, unbelievable to think just about that. Jesus' best friend uh, is writing, and his, his gospel is so unique because half of it only encompasses a few hours. He just he zooms in on the last few hours of Jesus' life, uh, and John, John 17 is after he had spent some time with the disciples in the upper room. He had walked through his last marching orders for them. He had uh, washed their feet. He had given them um, the the communion, the Lord's Supper, and he knew that the cross was just a matter of hours away. Uh, He knew that Judas had left to betray him. And so we get this one glimpse of Jesus knowing that his death was a few hours away, uh, and he goes to the garden, and he is spending some time praying and I've thought much over the years, if I knew that I just had about uh, 12 hours left on planet Earth, what would I pray about? What would I be thinking about? Uh, and that's what makes this, we call it this the high priestly prayer. That's what makes this so interesting uh, is because we see that the top priorities for Jesus, because no doubt if you have a few hours left, you're going to prioritize what you pray for. And so this is the context of John chapter 17, the last few hours of Jesus' life on Earth, Uh, He's praying to his father, and John records these words for us. So John chapter 17, I'm just going to read the first three verses. This is the longest prayer that we have recorded uh, of the Lord Jesus himself, Um, so it's worth you spending some time, if you haven't already, working through the rest of this. But uh, John 17, 1 through 3, the Holy Spirit through John says this, When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven And he said, Father, the hour has come, meaning the cross is here. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Jesus had spent 33 years doing the work to provide a perfect sacrifice to take a sinless life to a cross, to die in our place for our sins, and he had done the work to accomplish our salvation, to give us eternal life, but then in in a very succinct way, he sums up and defines the end goal of all things, right? 
the end goal of all things, the reason that you were created, the reason that Jesus had done what he had done uh, so that he might purchase us eternal life, and he says this. This is eternal life that they know you, okay? Don't miss that. Uh, Don't miss the difference between knowing God and knowing about God, okay? That's where I think unless we really have a good lens of spiritual disciplines, uh, we can stop just one step short. Oftentimes we can treat uh, Bible study, meditation, prayer, uh, all these disciplines as a way to know things about God, but that is not the ultimate goal of them. Like the ultimate goal uh, of all those is for us to know God, to have a relationship uh, with God Almighty. He says to know the, uh, that they may know you the only true God, and Jesus Christ who you have sent. So even as we walk through some disciplines, I want to encourage us to think about the end goal of those is not to gather information, uh, but it's to know a person, right? Uh, It's not to gather information, it's to know a person. Most of the time, and especially when it has to do with people, uh, we gather information, but that's never supposed to be the end in and of itself. Like we gather information to decide if we want to uh, pursue a relationship with someone, uh, I, when I was uh, dating, there were, I don't even think there were dating apps and different uh, websites where you could do that. I know that's very uh, popular now, but I think, you know, here, here would be an analogy. Uh, if you get online to try to gather information about somebody, say, oh, I, I, I want a wife, uh, need to find somebody, and you get on and you look at a bunch of different profiles, what you're doing is you're learning about people, right? And then theoretically, you find, okay, I've got enough information on this one that I would like to pursue a relationship with that person. Because if it stops short of there, and you're just like, I just like, I really like the information about this girl. And then you print it out, and you put it on your wall, and you just devote your life to information about this person. What's that called? Stalking, right? That's not, that's not healthy. That's not normal for it to just end in just like endless devotion to learning information about someone that you don't have a relationship with. Uh, Don't do that. Write this down. Don't do that. What's the goal? The goal in that setting is to gather enough information to say, okay, I know enough about this person. I now want to use that information to pursue a relationship uh, with that person. Uh, That happened to me when I was in college at DBU, saw this uh, girl, and I asked my friend, I said, who is that? Uh, They said, that's Hannah Harper. I said, I need some information about Hannah Harper. Gathered enough information information to think, wow, I should pursue a relationship with her. I've been married 17 years now. Praise the Lord. I didn't just stop with just the information, but it's so easy, uh, especially in our context, um, to, to, to use these disciplines to just know information about God, no facts, no accurate theology, no good things. That is not the end goal. Right? The end goal is for us to know God, to relationally know God, and those two things are very different. Uh, you know, there's, there's so many different positive things that could come out of the different spiritual disciplines that are just healthy. They're healthy habits for humans. They create space. They uh, help us uh, be more uh, mentally healthy. They help us slow down. They even have some positive uh, physical ramifications, but the end goal of all these, the highest purpose is to know God. How many of y'all have read the book Knowing God? J.I. Packer, uh, goodness, it's got to be on the top, you know, five or ten lists of uh, some of the most helpful books that have been written in the last hundred years. And he says this in his book Knowing God. He says, we must seek in studying God to be led to God. And so I, I want to take three different disciplines and have, have some time with these different sessions to look at each one of them. Uh, and, and for each one of these, I want there to be a, a theological component, just looking at God's Word and seeing what it says about that. Uh, but I also want to have some really practical uh, tips where I hope it kind of helps us as we not just seek to understand these things, but to implement these things. Uh, so the first one I want to spend some time talking about this morning is solitude. Okay, uh, I, you probably already know this about me just from the last 10 minutes, but uh, it's much easier for me if there's a little bit of dialogue than just monologue. So everybody say solitude. solitude. Then I just kind of know we're still awake and we're still, we're still tracking. Um, I've, I've noticed, and maybe you have too, that Jesus had a really uh, incredible habit of seeking solitude, uh, of all the time habitually trying to change his location so that he could get some time alone. And if you read through an honest look of the Gospels, you find out Jesus was a very, very busy man. 
Uh, there were a lot of people, especially uh, as his ministry would progress throughout the months and years, so many people after his time, he, so many people were just following him and crowding around him and wanting things from him um, that you can tell there was, some, there was some, almost a negative effect of that where he had to pursue solitude, that that was a pretty high priority for Jesus. Um, I, I'm going to work through a couple things here in, in Matthew and Mark. Uh, you don't have to turn there, but you're welcome to. We're going to move uh, fairly quickly through these. But before his ministry ever began, kind of right around that mark, uh, 30 years, uh, so he's about 30 years old, about to open up his public ministry. In Matthew 4, verse 1, it says this, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the, what? The wilderness. And he would go spend some time alone in the, in the wilderness, praying, fasting. That, that, there was something uniquely needed about solitude to prepare him for his public ministry. In Mark chapter 1, verse 35, says this, rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. Uh, some people call this, um, this just the discipline of solitude. Uh, I call it the discipline of desolate places, um, one, because you see that phrase in the New Testament a lot. Two, because I live in Midland, right? So it kind of connects to me. I'm like, you know what? I kind of get the desolate, desolation, desolate places. But it says like that, that seems to be not just a one-off deal, but over and over and over. It was his custom. It was normal. It was habitual for him to get up early, go to a, change his location with pursuing a desolate place where there was nobody else, no other distractions. In Mark 6... Verse 30, it says this, the apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught, and he said to them, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. So not only was it a priority for him, he tried to translate this uh, to his disciples so they would learn to seek desolate places and to find solitude. Uh, for many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. I've noticed a theme throughout the New Testament uh, that Jesus really spent a lot of time pursuing desolate places. Uh, in fact, there's a lot of different people all throughout the Old and New Testament that it just seems like there's something special when God wants to uh, speak or connect with someone. Oftentimes, there's a desolate place involved. Uh, think about Moses in Exodus 3 uh, when God wanted to meet with him. It says that he was out on the backside of the wilderness. He wasn't even in the wilderness. He was on the backside of the wilderness, and that's where God met him and spoke with him. Uh, David, uh, who obviously we've got all the Psalms of David that he has shared with us, uh, and you think about David as a man after God's own heart, uh, but God met with him so many times in the wilderness when he was alone tending sheep. Uh, Elijah, do you remember the story when, uh, of, of the still small voice and when God wanted to get Elijah's attention that he had to drag him out into a desolate place, into the wilderness, and he had this, uh, this interaction with God. John the Baptist in Luke Chapter 1, verse 80, it says, And this child grew and became strong in spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. You just you see, working through the Bible, that it's rare um, that God seems to reveal himself to people that are rushed, which is us, right? <laughs> or people that are distracted, sometimes he will change their location to remove those distractions um, so that he can get some time to engage with them. Uh, he, he rarely speaks to people when they're in a hurry. He does something often to slow them down and to remove that from them so they can have some conversation. And so Jesus had a habit of seeking solitude, of the spiritual discipline of getting alone with God. Often that would be a change in geography or, or location to pursue a desolate place. So uh, I want to look at three, three different things, just kind of where, uh, where, where do we look for these red flags or these alarms where something happens in our soul, maybe we feel it in our life, or we think, you know, this is probably a moment or a season where I need to be aware of this, and I need to go, as Jesus did, and go seek, a, 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 seek some solitude or a desolate place. And I think number one is just that distracted people uh, need desolate places. 
right? Distracted people need desolate places and stop me when I'm wrong. We're a distracted people, aren't we? Aren't there so many things in our life that are just at our attention and need our time and are demanding of us and, um, and not just relationships and responsibilities, but even uh, the phone and social media and things that are just constantly distracting. I don't know if you have uh, read some of the stats, I'm sure you have, but we are a very distracted people. Um, I read just uh, not too long ago that we now have the average uh, attention span of a goldfish, which uh, is not that long, apparently. <laughs> Uh, about eight seconds. Uh, er the average American right now checks their phone every 4.3 minutes. Um, not even because we're looking for something or because we need to, just because we have been habituated uh, to be constantly distracted. Uh, and, and, and these studies would say that the, the American mind being subject to all of the electronics that we have has a very difficult time focusing on linear thought for extended periods of time, which is really what a lot of the spiritual disciplines are, that the more distracted you are, the more often you need some isolation, some alone time in a desolate place. I don't know if you feel distracted. Have you ever sat down to pray and uh, you thought, you know, I should probably devote some, some serious time to prayer? 12 seconds later, right? Your mind goes here, your mind goes there, your phone vibrates. The more distractions we have, the more we need this. Distracted people uh, need to, to figure out this, this spiritual discipline of desolate places. Distraught people need to figure this out. Sometimes life is just difficult. Uh, sometimes there's uh, brokenness that we feel, we are hurt, we are crushed, we are confused, maybe scared, maybe grieving. Uh, maybe you've been gossiped about or slandered in uh, your circles or your family. Maybe you're in a predicament where you just don't really know what the answer is, but you have to make a decision on something. Maybe you've been betrayed. Maybe there's been some cancer in the family. Maybe kids are very, very difficult. Uh, there's all sorts of different causes that can help cause us to feel um, this just like sense of being distraught. What, what do you do when you have those feelings, when you have those moments? Uh, go, go to Matthew 14. Because I'm going to read a big chunk of this. This is when Jesus got some really distressing news uh, that uh, I, I'm sure caused him to feel very distraught. And I just want you to see very simply what he did and how he reacted. Uh, this is when the 12 disciples brought Jesus some really bad news about uh, his cousin and really good friend, John the Baptist. Matthew 14, verse 3. It says, For Herod had seized John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because John had been saying, it is not lawful for you to have her. Well, there's a whole side sermon right there just on the, the dangers of, of, um, of pastors speaking the truth in political places where uh, he, he spoke the truth to this politician as he well should, but that came at a high price. And though he wanted to put him to death, he feared the people because they held him to be a prophet. But when Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias danced before the company and, he, and pleased Herod so that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. Prompted by her mother, she said, give me the head of John the Baptist here on a platter. And the king was sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he commanded it be given. He sent and had John beheaded in prison and his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl, and she brought it to her mother. And the disciples came and took the body, the headless body, buried it, and they went and told Jesus. Now, get, get in that emotional space for a moment, um, that someone that was preaching the same gospel that you were, that you had uh, a very similar, you, you were, your, your life was charted on a similar course, and you were deeply connected relationally, had his head cut off, brought in at a party, and your disciples come and tell you that's happened, just the amount of, 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 of grief and sadness and, and anxiety that might come into that. What did Jesus do with that? How did he respond when he was in that emotional place? Now, when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. You will notice what you do in those moments reveals a lot about you, right? Where you go when you are distraught, when you are 
frustrated reveals a lot about what we would say is our functional savior. And you see when Jesus had these moments, uh, he, he just, he had to get away. This, this idea of being alone and, ha- and seeking solitude in a desolate place was important to Jesus. Uh, let's keep going. Uh, Matthew chapter 26. Jesus is about to carry our sins to the cross. This is very similar uh, timing to what we just read in John 17. He was scared, he was anxious, he was nervous, he was so stressed, he was sweating drops of blood. In Matthew 26, it says, then Jesus went with them to a place called, called Gethsemane. He, he, he needed to, to relate to, to hear from, to speak to God. He, he needed to, to be with his God, and so he, he changed his location, goes to the garden, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, He began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death, remain here and watch with me. And going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed. Even that night, he was trying to seek some time alone with God. I would make this case that if Jesus needed to pursue some time alone, so do we, okay? whether it's because we're distracted or it's because we're distraught or whatever it might be. If Jesus needed some desolate places, then surely we do. Uh, Luke 15 is the last one I'll look at. Uh, It's not so much that he was distracted, uh, probably not even so much that he was distraught, uh, but in this particular case, he was very overwhelmed, uh, perhaps overstimulated, definitely drained, and potentially uh, on the edge of burning out because there was just so much demanded of him. How did he respond? Luke 5, 15. But now even more, the report about him went about, went abroad, and great crowds gathered to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities, but he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. I'm sure at some point you have felt that. You have felt um, pulled in many different directions. You have felt drained. You have felt overwhelmed. Um, It's easy to instead just go to uh, mindless scrolling through Netflix or social media. But what we do in those moments reveals a lot about what we're truly after. So I want to walk through some very practical things uh, and maybe even give you the, the challenge of just looking through the New Testament at that idea of desolate places and how important that was to Jesus' spiritual health and try to employ that. But four quick things that I think are very uh, helpful and hopefully practically uh, helpful for you uh, is number one, location matters, right? To find a place uh, where you can go and have just be removed from the distractions and find a desolate place, uh, location matters, all right, sometimes it can be your vehicle. Sometimes you may need to go find uh, a park to go to. Sometimes I think it might be uh, deeper than that where you need to find a, a place to go out of town, a, a cabin to borrow or a national forest to walk around in or go camping, but physically change just as they did to, uh, to find a location where there's some distractions that are removed uh, and you find your own desolate place. Uh, I've got a couple of these uh, places that I've kind of adopted as my desolate place, right, that I can go when I feel either incredibly overwhelmed or distraught, or I, I just feel like I need to get alone and to connect with God. Uh, Powder Canyon, the mountains, there's a lot of different options, um, but I would encourage you to think about a short-term and a long-term option. Like, what's a short-term option? If you just get some news today that rocks your world and you need to find a place to go, uh, sometimes a closet won't do it because my kids know where all my closets are, right? Like, to find a a short-term place where you're just like, this is my dedicated desolation place, uh, and then a longer-term place that's more often planned, it's more uh, proactive sometimes than than reactive, uh, to to find a place, to find a place because location matters, it sure seemed to matter to Jesus. Uh, number two, uh, this is a, somewhat of a no-brainer, but to try to leave distractions or to turn them off, right? If you go to the most remote place in the most remote desert on the planet, but you bring your phone, it doesn't really do the same thing, right? We've got to not only find a way to leave distractions, but find a way to turn distractions off, uh, if we have all the entire world in our pocket, then, then that's oftentimes what we have to get away from. Um, leave distractions or turn them off. Number three, uh, and this applies not, not only to this, but to all spiritual disciplines, is that it is a discipline, meaning it, it, needs, uh, it needs some work, it takes some effort, it often doesn't just happen 
naturally. If you're like me, uh, you set aside some time, you have set aside a specific purpose, you say, I'm gonna go here and I'm gonna uh, turn everything off and I'm gonna focus and I wanna really pray and listen and connect with God and then you find out two, two, two minutes later that that's incredibly difficult, that it's something that's worth working for, it's something that's worth fighting for. Um, I, I'm not gonna present any tools that we don't already have, right? I've got a lot of tools in my garage the problem is that some of them have just been sitting there for years and I haven't touched them. Are you the same way? The, the problem isn't necessarily us having the, the tools for spiritual discipline. Uh, the, 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 sometimes the problem is just uh, picking them up and, and using them. So just know that it's a discipline. It's difficult. It's incredibly hard, I believe, in our culture to get away and to focus our mind for long periods of time. And the number four, uh, I think frequency matters. Uh, I think the frequency that we pursue some solitude matters. Uh, You've probably heard this uh, terminology before, but I think it's helpful uh, that we should seek to divert daily, uh, to withdraw weekly, and to abandon annually. So this is what I want to encourage you just very practically. If you think about Jesus had the need for solitude and what he did in that to connect with his Father, and as we do that, think about um, putting this into your own your own calendar, to divert daily, uh, to find some time, even if it's 10 or 20 minutes, not just to sit down and read, but to change a location, to get to a place where you remove distractions, and every day you have a place where you go where you get to reconnect with God. Divert daily. Find some time. I I think most often the more regular it is, the easier it is to do. Uh, If it's a a set time every day, we have a better chance of actually doing that. Uh, Divert daily. Uh, Withdraw weekly. You know, this is somewhat the idea of, of the Sabbath that we've been commanded to not just set aside some rest, but to set aside some time to rest and focus. Uh, I think it's important to have a, a bigger chunk of time weekly where you get to get alone from the distractions and reconnect with God. Jesus defined that as eternal life. Eternal life is that we may know God, okay? Divert daily, withdraw weekly. Number three, abandon annually. Okay, this is what I have um, had, a, had the privilege uh, to do mainly because my wife is just an incredible person. Uh, she's very selfless, she's very sacrificial, and over the years she's given me uh, just a lot of chance to, to get away. Uh, and so what I've tried to do, I've tried to do this most years, uh, about two times a year, sometimes it happens only one time a year, uh, where I, uh, I, I very proactively think about trying to get away for two to three days uh, of solitude and silence. Uh, So I would encourage you to think about doing something similar. And this is what it looks like for me. Uh, You can uh, tweak this to make it helpful for you. Uh, But I often take a journal uh, and I think through different uh, areas of my life. I normally start with just me as a Christian. And then I think of me as a husband, then me as a father, then me as a pastor, then me as a friend. Uh, And I spend some time thinking about each one of those things and uh, we'll spend some time and we'll get out of town. Uh, we'll go to often a cabin. Uh, so I've got a friend that has a cabin on the South Llano River in Junction, which is just uh, beautiful and desolate, not much distractions, no cell phone service. Uh, so I'll go there and I'll take a Bible, I'll take a pen, I'll take my pad, uh, and I'll try to uh, spend some time doing what I think Jesus would have done in a desolate place. Uh, is to remove distractions and to think through each one of those areas of my life. And I'll think through as a Christian, what, what is it uh, this year that I need to work on, that I need to repent of, that I need to grow in uh, and spend quite a bit of uh, hours thinking and praying and listening on that? Uh, and then I'll move to the next one. As a husband, what is my wife going to need from me? Uh, what is she walking through in this next season of life? Uh, what is it that I need to do better at? What is it that I need to pray for my wife about uh, and, and, and journal and work through that? And oftentimes, uh, I'll walk out of those, those seasons with kind of a, a guidebook for the next 12 months of my life. Uh, then I'll start working through my kids, and I'll think through each one of my kids. What, what, what are they experiencing this year? What challenges do they have? What do they need to know? Uh, and just try to listen to God and know God and know what that means for my life as a father. And just kind of work through all the different responsibilities that I have. But doing that in this context of an isolation and alone, it, just for me, it has been so incredibly helpful. Uh, things I can't do in my office, things I can't do on the couch, I've got to go to a desolate place. So uh, that, that's what I would encourage you to think about, uh, to, to think about what, what are the reasons Jesus made this a priority 
what, what are ways that you can weave this into your life, either daily, weekly, or annually, uh, and then begin to make a plan to find some desolate places? I think the more we find, you don't even, it's not that you find it, you, we, we work for it, we carve it out to make some time to connect with God one-on-one makes you a stronger man. God pours into you, you listen to him, you begin to hear his voice, and just that alone has a tendency to flow out into the other areas of our lives. So I wanna take some time uh, just right now to pray towards that, um, just to pray that God would, uh, would stir us up to make us, um, to make us men that will purposefully go find some time to relate with God, to know God. Can I do that? Let me invite you to bow your head, close your eyes, and let's pray together. Father, I pray this morning that you might even slow our hearts and our minds down. God, I, I recognize that oftentimes the most important thing that we were created for is sometimes the most difficult to simply know you, not, not just to, to learn about you and to have uh, accurate theology of you, but to use those as a tool to know you, to understand your heart, to feel your presence, to learn to hear your voice. So Holy Spirit, this morning I pray that you would make us men that prioritize our relationship with our God enough to find a desolate place to get there and to connect with you, Father. I pray as these men do that, that you would, that you would show up, that you would speak to them in whatever way it is that you want, God, that you would give them direction, that you would strengthen their souls. God, no doubt some men in this room have big decisions, and I pray they would find a place alone and that you would give them your wisdom to help them navigate that according to your plans. God, some men in this room carry some deep hurt and brokenness and they're distraught over things. I pray that they might find you in a desolate place and that you would uh, whisper to them that uh, that they're your son and you love them. They would feel your, your comforting presence. God, no doubt men in this room are tired and pulled in all sorts of directions, I pray that as they find a desolate place that you would fill up their tank, that you would fill up their cup, God, that you would pour into them so they would continually have enough to continue to pour out to the people that need them. God, just give us the strength and the discipline to get away, to meet you, and not just to meet you, but to enjoy meeting with you and communing with you. And our world is a very distracted place and that is not a spiritually neutral thing. There, is a, there are forces behind many of the distractions that are after our hearts and our minds. And I pray that you would help us to know you. God, we know on this side of glory, our relationship with you is by faith. That we believe we've never seen you we know and believe that you're there. And God, until, until we get to, to see Jesus face to face and until our relationship um, takes, takes a move and a step out of faith into reality and to, to seeing you, I pray that you truly would help us to know you by faith. God, would you mark us as men that know our God as people interact with us? I pray that they might feel and sense that we are men that know our God And I'm reminded of Philippians chapter three when Paul is praying and he's saying that he would set aside all of his spiritual resume that he may know Christ and be found in him. God, for the sake of your church and our wives and our families and our cities, pray that you'd help us to slow down Help us to find solitude so that we meet with you. We love you, Jesus. Pray this all in your name. Amen.